Hello and welcome. My name is Keith Barker, and today at 11 a.m. every Sunday Pacific time, we have an online quiz. I took that recording and edited it down, and this is that edited version. Enjoy. We've got, I think, just six or seven questions. They're going to go quick. And here is your first question. It is multiple select, and it is this. What allows secure connectivity, including multicast support, over the public internet? All right, GRE and IPsec, why is that the case? So we need multicast and secure connectivity. Let's bring up a whiteboard. Site one and site two. So we have two sites that are both connected to the internet and we have a router at one edge and a router at the other edge. And then we have our, our PCs and all those other devices that are hanging out there. In the old days, in the old days, we'd use IPsec by simply specifying to this router, router one, saying, hey, listen, if you ever need to reach traffic over here at 10.2, and this is the 10.1 network kind of left, go ahead and just encrypt it, which is great for IPsec, encrypt the traffic, and then shoot it over to your peer, R2, as individual packets. Then people on the internet, when they looked at that data, it was just being encrypted using some type of encryption algorithm, very like the AES. Well, the problem with that is that if there's a multicast or a need for multicast, like uh, or broadcast even in the case of like routing protocols where they need to advertise, you can't ship multicast traffic over there. So to solve that, we use a tunnel and a GRE, generic route encapsulation. We can build a logical tunnel over the internet. It's called a GRE tunnel. Now a GRE tunnel itself is not secure, but it does support multicast. Think of it like a uh, 10.1 network here, 10.2 network here, and logically a 10.12 network here that is logically across the internet, but it's not secure. So we also use IPsec or encryption to encrypt that traffic. So for WAN connectivity, one very viable option is to use GRE tunnels along with IPsec. And that way we can have confidentiality, meaning we're protecting the data, we're encrypting it. So anybody who eavesdrops on the internet can't really make sense of it. And then secondly, we also, because we're doing the encryption of a GRE tunnel, we have the benefit of multicast support across. So we have dynamic routing protocols that basically advertise over the tunnel, the 10.1 and the 10.2 networks respectively. Here we go. Question number two. In a spine leaf architecture, which of the following are true regarding switch connectivity? All right. A full mesh between leaf and spine layers. These are leaves. And so the leaf has a full mesh to every spine. See, so boom, 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 boom. And that is the only answer on the board that was correct. See, the leaves are not directly connected to each other. There's no full mesh there. And the spine devices are not, switches are not connected directly to each other. But there is a full mesh between the leaf layer and the spine layer. And that basically makes equidistance, makes a predictable uh, throughput between a device hanging off here and a device hanging off anywhere in this infrastructure. Because regardless of you know, where that device is, this leaf device has equidistance from every spine node in the topology. All right. How many people, how many people got that right? Let's take a look. 52. Nice. Keep it up. You're doing great. Here's question three of seven. What is the primary device at the distribution layer? <laughs> okay, okay. I can take a little hint. I hear you. I see the chats. I uh, are saying, you know, the uh, the graphic kind of really helped on that a little bit. <laughs> so at the distribution layer, the primary device there is going to be a multi-layer switch. And I'm going to resist talking a little bit more about the three-tier hierarchical model because I've got one or two more questions on it. And there's only four more questions to go. So I don't want to give that away, but more is coming on the three-tier hierarchical model. First place is still Dr. Jaguar, and it's still a very close race. Glad everybody's here. Thank you very much for spending a few minutes with me today. This is multiple select. The question is this, in a three-tier hierarchical, hierarchical model, easy for me to say, which are true regarding the layers? Pick all the answers that are accurate or true. All right. All right. All right. Let's see here. Let's just talk. Wow, great answers. I got a few on red, though. Primary goal of access is, is speed and fault tolerance. Let's just take a peek at the media right here. And it's it's interesting a little bit to me that I've, I've been working with Cisco gear and networks for a long 
a long time. And I remember like over a decade ago, this is one of the things that hasn't changed too much. And it basically works like this. The access layer, this is where people like Bob, where they plug in. So printers, users, et cetera, connect to the access layer. And for Bob himself, as he's connected to this one port, there's not a whole bunch of fault tolerance there. I mean, if that port fails, Bob's out of luck. Now we do have a little bit of fault tolerance as the access device has connections to the two devices at the distribution layer. And these are multi-layer switches. So we have VLANs. So the VLANs exist here, like VLANs 10, 20, 30. They also exist here, but they stop here as far as like a broadcast because the switched virtual interfaces, the layer three logical interfaces for each of VLANs exist on these distribution multi-layer switches. And so if somebody, if Bob sends a broadcast, like an ARP request, it's going to go to every other port in Bob's VLAN. That's where the switch is going to send it. It's going to, this is a layer two switch here, by the way, and it's going to forward it to uh, up the trunks, which will be tagged uh, with the appropriate VLAN. These switches up here will then forward it to all the other ports or trunks in that same VLAN. But because that's the end of the VLAN, that's where it ends, they are not going to forward a broadcast to the core. And so it's the end of the road for a broadcast. So VLANs terminate here, we have routing here, and then the core, they used to call this a distribution block. So if we had like this distribution block as part of our network, then we could have another one and another one and another one and another one. And then the core is how we can tie all of them together. So on a campus where you had like 15 of these situations, they all connect together at the core. And you can have layer two cores or layer three cores. And this just depends on how many peerings you expect and what type of imp implementation. In the old days, it mattered about throughput and speed because, uh, well, these days, multi-layer switches, they do all their work in ASICs hardware. So they're extremely fast. Whether they're doing a layer three or a layer two forwarding, it's lightning speed. So the key is at the core, we want fault tolerance and we want high speed, not a lot of rules or access control lists here, just moving traffic as fast as possible. Then we can do the routing and the filtering and so forth at the distribution layer. All right, that hasn't changed for like decades. <laughs> However, with SD access and, you know, spine leaf and other options in the data center, we are, you know, there are other options than this, but this certainly on the blueprint. It asks about two tier and three tier. So here's an example of three tier. Next question, this is five of seven. Again, so glad that you are here with me spending a few minutes. Also, all these recordings of these quiz sessions, I edit the current ones. I'm offloading, editing, and then uploading. So they're there on my, in a playlist called Quiz Sessions. You can always find on my YouTube channel if you'd like. Okay, question 507, which cloud option does not, I repeat, does not require updating the server operating system? by the client themselves. All right, which cloud option does not require updating server OS by the client themselves? And that is an example of a service called platform as a service. Let's just talk about those for a moment. Be uh, if we are using cloud services, what does that mean? Well, it basically means we're using somebody else's stuff. Like if you're using file services in the cloud, it's somebody else's file storage that we're paying for. So if we wanted to, like if we went to Amazon Web Services and we said, you know what, I want two 2019 uh, Windows servers and I want infrastructure and I want so many gigabytes of RAM and so much hard disk and so forth, we could, you know, rent all that effectively in AWS or in, in Azure or Google Cloud. We could rent that. And, but if we do that and we do infrastructure as a service, we're responsible for the servers and their OS, and nobody's gonna come in and magically patch them for us and supply the update. If we're in charge of the whole thing virtualized, we are in charge of what OS is gonna be there and is it updated and so forth. That's what infrastructure as a service brings to the table. Platform as a service, you know what? That says, you know what? Let the vendor take care of all the nitty gritty details behind the scenes, like, um, you know, what OS is there, making sure it's patched, all that good stuff. All we want is a platform for software development that we wanna use. So. IIS has the most responsibility for the user for maintaining the virtualized environment. Platform as a service has less because we're using it as a development environment. And then software as a service is basically the customer doing nothing except consuming the application. So with software as a service, they have an application on, running somewhere in the cloud and all the customer does is they log in and through an interface, they use that service, that software. Uh, Salesforce would be one of those, software as a service 
where they simply just use the service and they don't have to worry about operating systems or virtualized networking or anything else. They're just using the service. So in this arc, so in this question, this the cloud option that does not require updating the server server OS by the client would be platform as a service because the service provider is doing all that for us. Many of you knocked that out of the park. Way to go. Here is our next question. Just two more and we're done. Question six of seven, multiple select, which wide area network or WAN methods are typical for small office home offices? Which there's a lot more these days than there was a year ago. All right, DSL and cable are indeed uh, the two main methods from this list. MPLS is a, a nice, wonderful thing, but it's typically for companies with the money to pay for it as a service from a service provider, MPLS, over the company's MPLS network. And Frame Relay, boy, we're not seeing that too much anymore. But however, there still could be some Frame Relay. That's very corporate-esque. You're not like, <laughs> okay, a couple things about Frame Relay. We're, we're not likely to see it anymore. However, if we do, we're not likely to see it at a home office or small office. It's more of a, a really legacy technology that corporations use when they were moving away from lease, uh, lease lines. So DSL, digital subscriber line, and cable are the two answers that we're looking for here. And let me clear off my screen. I think we have one more question. All right, no pressure, but this is it. <laughs> question seven of seven, multiple select. Which technologies are commonly used? in small offices, home offices. All right, the common technologies are indeed PAT and VPNs. So VPNs come in a few flavors, and one of those is a site-to-site -site VPN, which would look like, we talked about that earlier, you have site one and site two, and you're connected over an untrusted network, and we use a, some type of VPN, which has cryptography, encryption for privacy, and also hashing for data integrity, also authentication to verify that the peers are who they say they are. There'd be a site-to-site -site VPN, and that's possible from a Soho. So we have the Soho going to the corporate office headquarters with a site-to-site uh, -site VPN. Now, if we do a site-to-site -site VPN, it basically gives everybody over here at site one access to the resources over here at site two. Now, is that what you want? In a small office, home office, Let's imagine that this is us. So you and I are at site one and it's our house and we've got Xbox and we've got PlayStation and we've got IOT and we've got televisions possibly. And we've got other devices that are all connected to our network. Do you, <laughs> if we're doing a site to site VPN, which is effectively allowing everything over here at site one to go to site two, do we really want to include all these devices and have them have potential access, especially if there's a compromise over here? Perhaps not. So instead of doing that, we could use what's called a remote access VPN. And when you think of remote access VPN, think of one device like Bob's computer at his house connected to the internet. And then Bob it himself, just that one device is getting VPN access over. And that technology, when he's going over here to headquarters, that technology could use things like IPsec, which is possible with a remote access VPN like this. And it could also use SSL slash TLS, which is really, you know, some secure flavor of TLS that could be used as well. And in the world of Cisco, the primary way of doing that is the AnyConnect client. So when you hear the word, oh, I'm running the AnyConnect client, one of the things AnyConnect does is provide VPN, remote access VPN support for a, a workstation like Bob to build a remote access VPN tunnel. It also does other cool things like <laughs> 802.1x authentication and supplicant work and um, also interrogating the system for looking for compliance. But for the purpose of VPNs, it's a great VPN client as well. All right, let's take a look and see who, who just nailed this. And if you're brand new to some of these technologies and some of these options, this is a great place to start just to realize you know, what you should be looking at. All of this was from the blueprint, by the way. Uh, the blueprint, the exam topics downloaded from Cisco's site. As I grab it again, that was section 1.2. Two-tier, three-tier, spine leaf, WAN, small office, home office, and on-prem via cloud, and via cloud, and that's what we covered. All right, let's take a look at who won. You all won, basically. And let me be silent for a moment. Here we go.
if you have any questions uh, about some of the things that we just touched on uh, and you'd like to ask them, I'll take a few minutes right now in the live stream. Uh, also, if you want to join us for these future quizzes every Sunday, 11 a.m. Pacific time, I craft either a brand new quiz or an updated quiz that has these CCNA relevant you know, topics in it to help gauge your understanding and confirm it. So if you have a question for me right now in this live stream, go ahead and just do an at Keith Barker so it's easy for me to see it, and I'd be happy to go ahead and take it. Also, right after this, we're going to be jumping into the Discord server in the CCNA voice chat room, which is always a party as well. Again, I'd like to thank Morgan and also Kelvin this morning or earlier today for helping me improve a few of these questions and improve them. And as a community, we can do this. And if you want to get your CCNA, this channel, Keith Barker on YouTube, and its resources can assist you in getting there.